All right. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 61 is such a fascinating chapter to me. I, I want to look at the first three verses real quick. Uh, 61 verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He might be glorified. Let's open up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I need your help this morning. Lord, I ask that you would anoint me with your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would fill me up and give me your words. Lord, I pray that you would help me to only say things that would glorify you and that we could praise you for. Lord, I ask that you would uh, just give me the mind of Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would get everyone here a mind to hear and ears to hear your word. Lord, we need your help. We have a big prayer and we're asking you to show your will and we trust that you will. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to give you some context first of all. And uh, I, I like marker boards personally. I, I like to write and to draw, I'll do pictures and all sorts of stuff. I want to keep it simple this morning. It, it'll probably get a little more complex tonight. Uh, but I, uh, I, I've written this verse. This is the primary verse we're talking about this morning. Verse number one. Um, where Jesus quoted this in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. They gave him the book. He read it. He sat down. He preached in the synagogue. Awesome story. I was going to start there, but instead I went back to the source. And that's what we're going to look at today. Now, it's important for us to understand the context of anything that we preach. Now, if we look at chapter 60, what's happening is there was a judgment pronounced and things were happening through Isaiah. And then God's giving some hope. He's giving some of these millennial promises. We have an everlasting heritage with the Lord. Uh, look at verse number 18 in the previous chapter. Isaiah 60, verse 18, violence shall no more be heard in thy land. Boy, I look forward to that day, the day of peace. We as Christians should be called peacemakers, not warmongers, okay? We should not be waving a flag for a war in another nation, or we shouldn't say, hey, we should go over there and get them. No, no, no. Jesus wants us to be peacemakers. Let's not forget that. Violence shall no more be heard in the land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise the sun shall be no more thy light by day neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee but the lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light and thy god thy glory well how fascinating is that that we won't need a light in the resurrection because jesus is our light he's our everlasting light now many of you know this is quoted in revelation where it says and they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads and there shall be no night there and they need no candle neither light of the sun for the lord god giveth them light and they shall reign forever and ever. We will rule and reign with Him one day, and we're not going, uh, we'll have a different body. We won't need the sun to sustain our energy or our life, and we won't need the moon by night because we'll be a resurrected spiritual being. So, understanding this context in Isaiah, He's giving us some eternal promises, and this is always good because when we walk by sight instead of walking by faith, and we start to look around at all the problems that we're surrounded with, and we look at how successful the devil is in this world, and we see that we're outnumbered, sometimes our hearts get overcharged, depressed, beat down, brokenhearted. I want to talk about healing the brokenhearted this morning. This is how Jesus quoted it in Luke chapter 4. In Isaiah 61, he has a lot to talk about. Look at verse number 1. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to... Now wait. The anointing is the Holy Spirit. Why does God give us the Holy Spirit? What's the Holy Spirit for? It's to give us utterance in prayer. 
Sometimes to give us the words when we don't even know what to ask for, the Holy Spirit will pray through us. And for those of you that were with us in Sunday school, we touched on some of that in our lesson. Uh, it tells us in the book of John that, that, that the Spirit of truth, that He will lead us and guide us into truth. And when we're trying to figure out what's really going on, we got to get back to Jesus and we got to get back to the Bible and we got to ask for His Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us. I think it's in the book of Romans where He says that His Spirit will bear witness with our Spirit. Spirit. And boy, sometimes you're out talking to somebody and it's, you're like, I could just feel the Holy Spirit working in that conversation. It was exciting, right? Uh, that Holy Spirit, if it's in you and in me, we can, like, He works between us and amongst us, right? Uh, but now, wait a minute. Sometimes that Holy Spirit is there to convince us of our sin, of where we need to work for God. That there's areas in our life that we need to repent of our sin for God's glory. We need to turn some things around and fix some things so that God can really use us as better Christians. This is very important. He's given us the Holy Spirit for many reasons. In this passage, though, it's for this reason. It's for boldness in preaching. God has given us of His Holy Spirit for many reasons, but one of the most important is so that we would open our mouth boldly and preach the gospel, as we ought to. That's what it says. We ought to open our mouth and tell somebody else who Jesus is, what He did, and that faith in Him alone saves. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. According to His mercy, He saved us. And the rest of the world and their systems of religion, they're trusting in their own works. One time out soul winning, it was raining and it was a tough neighborhood. These apartments, nobody was talking. This Muslim comes to the door and I was with a, a buddy and this mu he opened the door and he was like canning all sorts of things. It was a bizarre situation. I mean, he had like canned pickles and okra and asparagus and all, all over his living room. And it was kind of, okay, all right, you know. And he invited us in and he said, let me tell you what, what we have to do. I'm like, let me tell you what we have to do. And I thought, well, let me, let me just use this as a learning opportunity. I was able to present the gospel to him, and I was also able to ask him what his confidence was in for getting to heaven. And he said, well, if I just turn from all of my sin, Allah might accept me. If I just repent of my sin, then maybe I can go to heaven. And listen, that is a works salvation to say, if I can stop sinning, then I might make it. The whole world teaches that gospel. Only the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It doesn't say be a good person to go to heaven. It says trust in Him. He finished the work. And when you believe that, the Holy Spirit moves inside of you so you can tell somebody else. The Holy Spirit, we are anointed with the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel to others. Amen. That's why He gives us the Holy Spirit. Look at it. He says uh, in, in Isaiah 61, He says, to preach good tidings unto the meek. When Jesus quoted it, He said, to preach the gospel to the poor. You know, meek is not weak. Meek is power under control. Meek is quiet and peaceable and kind of standing your own ground. Meek is not weak. The world, they're, they're boisterous and loud and crazy. And sometimes we just hold our peace instead of giving up our peace. We're just going to hold on to it and talk to the Lord. So it's interesting that he, when, when Jesus quoted it, He said, preach to the poor. In my experience, when you go to a poor neighborhood... Usually the people are a little more receptive and honest. Yeah, I know I've sinned and I need a Savior. You go to the rich neighborhood. Oh, we're, we're good here. No, we're good. We go to the Lutheran church. We've got God just right where we want Him. Not in our house. We check that box every now and then. Jesus wants us to preach to the peak. and I, I, the, the, the meek, rather. I tell you, this is the goal. Let me cast the vision for the unity of this church. The goal is that we would go out into this neighborhood and preach the gospel. Amen. Very simple, very easy. Hard to do some days. I, I know not everybody's capable. It's hot out there and hard to get around. I, I get all that, but you know, I believe that God's will for our life is that we would go out into this community and knock every single door and preach the gospel. God's will for you, if you're saved, 
You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You still have breath in your lungs. You need to tell somebody that Jesus Christ forgave their sin. Don't go to hell. Don't go to hell. It's your choice if you'll just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And nobody's telling them they're listening to the news. They're listening to movies. They're listening to the music of the world. And it's just it's blinding their eyes to the truth of the free gift of the gospel. And until we go out... and. We, and we knock on their door and we, we meet them in the marketplace and we show up at their business and we talk to them on the side of the road. Until we do that, we are not using the Holy Spirit power to its fullness. You want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? You want to experience the fullness of the power? Friday night, you start praying as a family that you can meet someone that you can be a help to with the Scriptures. If I could count the number of times that we've gone out soul winning and somebody said, you're not going to believe this. We were just talking about this. We do uh, small town soul winning marathons. Uh, we've done Callahan, Hilliard, Baldwin, McClenny, Waycross. We went up to Waycross, I think it was two years ago. We've made Waycross a yearly event. We go up to Waycross, we knock those apartments. Brother Ross and uh, I, think, I think Brother Luke was with you that day. And there was a mom and her daughter and they're like, you're not going to believe this. We were just talking about this and we want to know and we're trying to figure out what to do about the school system and all these things. And it's like, wow, that's random. I don't think so. God has a divine appointment if you'll just allow yourself to be used of God. If you start by praying and say, God, use me. God, send me. God, I'll go. I believe in the power of the gospel. And most people just simply aren't using the Holy Ghost that's already in them to boldly open their mouth and preach the gospel. My vision is that we can knock every single door in this area. I want to see families restored to church. I want to see old members coming back. I want to see God doing something great. Uh, literally in every door goal. We have maps, we have apps, we have a list of old members, we've got phone book lists. We, do, we have a, an app on our phone that we can pinpoint, go to this house. Oh, don't go back to that house. They threatened us. They said, don't knock on my door again. We can take a picture. You can schedule an appointment for me to come by afterwards. we got all sorts of, we got follow-up literature. I want to get another big map for the wall. Uh, I thank God that is all liberty. We've been very successful at reaching the west side of Jacksonville to see a lot of salvations. Earlier this year, the Lord laid it on my heart, and we laid out maps on our app for White House. And that's the area we've been working. A few weeks ago, I met Brother Russell right down the road from here. God works when you make a plan. I want to see Otis in White House and Baldwin and, and, and Bulls Bay and Cisco Gardens and Crawford and Bryceville and, and who am I forgetting? Uh, Crystal Springs. I mean, I want to see these little townships around here get reached and I want to go into the house and I want to pull them out of the fire. I want to be able to use of God to see families restored and see the gospel preached that people would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and get saved. That's my vision. I believe we can knock every door in this region and I believe the Lord will bless it greatly I believe that he will in Acts 1 you know he said but ye shall receive power and after that the Holy Ghost shall come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth you know what that means Halsema and White House and Jacksonville and Georgia and the United States and the rest of the world there's a lot of churches, they say, well, we send a guy there, and we send a guy there, and we send a guy there, and, and we support some missionaries. We've got some folks that are out there doing it, and there's others out there that aren't really doing it. And my problem is there's a lot of churches in Jacksonville that aren't taking care of Jacksonville. I'm just being honest, and I'm not trying to tear anybody down, and I'm not trying to lift myself up. But I want to cast this vision. I want to give you a plan to see God's mercy in this area his grace to see god work in a mighty way 
And that's to see families restored and rebuilt. To see souls saved. To see the drunks give up the drugs. And just to see people say, you know what, I've had it. This is a miserable life and there's no joy. And Jesus promises that He'll save me and He'll forgive me. And then to get them in church and to follow up with them. To come back and learn some more. And come back and learn some more. So they can strengthen themselves from the inside with the Holy Scriptures through the Holy Spirit. People, are, they're numb to God these days. They're getting blasted in every direction on every channel. And they need some help. I want to pull them out of their fire. I love to see, I love, I love you. anybody, give me a name from somebody that used to go here. Let me go knock on their door and tell them something new is happening here. There's something different. Come and be part of it. As Jehu said, come and see my zeal for the Lord. I believe if we all take this attitude and say, I can be used of God to reach somebody. Don't put it all on the preacher. You have the Holy Spirit. If you've never been soul winning, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. We're going to have a soul winning school in a couple weeks. I'm going to give you all the resources and the practice and the training to be able to easily open your Bible and to preach the gospel. If you're not there yet, please come. Please be part of that. Isaiah 61, where we're at, look at it. He says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because... The Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. To bind up the brokenhearted. If you will, go to Galatians 6 in the New Testament. Go to Galatians 6. Jesus quoted that as heal the brokenhearted. If this sermon had a title, it would be that. Let's heal the broken. If you haven't noticed, there's a lot of broken people in this world. They're broken by drinking and drugs, and there's broken families. And if we can reach the fathers in this area and the mothers in this area and get them saved and get them to come to church and bring their family, we can heal the broken. It, this is a Baptist cause. You know, in the book of Malachi, it foretold that John the Baptist would come in the spirit and the power of Elijah, right? Uh, in Malachi 4, it says, He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers. That's what John the Baptist did. He was restoring families and getting them back on fire for God. He preached the baptism of repentance, saying to believe on Him that should come after Him. There's a lot of families that don't have the foundation of salvation and I speak this to our shame. We can do something about it. We really can. You're in Galatians 6. Look at verse 1. Again, I'm talking about healing the broken. Verse 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. I want to notice something here. First of all, he's saying, restore them that had a problem. Don't go down into the sin with them. Well, I'm going to go down and sit at the bar and try to evangelize some of those people. I wouldn't do that if I were you. That's contrary to the Holy Spirit. Now, you run into somebody and they're like, man, I'm just having all these problems. I can't get to work on time. I've got the brown bottle flu every Monday morning. You know, it just takes me an hour to get. Well, it's like, well, maybe if you quit putting that poison in your body, you wouldn't have that problem. Now, we can show some mercy and tell them God has a law. And when you break that law, there's a punishment in your body. But worse than that, there's a punishment of hell. And if they'll get saved and then get the scriptures in their heart and you can convince them, listen, if you'll try it God's way, you can have some healing. You can heal your family and heal your relationships. You can heal your body. He says in verse 2, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is to carry each other. Not to kick each other. Well, he got what he deserved. Why don't you reach down and pick them up and pull them up out of the muck and the mire? What's he saying, James? Of some having compassion, or Jude rather, Jude 1, 22 and 23 says, of some having compassion, making a difference, love them. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. You stay separate from the fleshly sins. Don't go down in there with them. But man, by the, by the love of God, you pull them out of it and you show them some grace and mercy and forgiveness and you heal the broken people and the broken hearted, and the broken families. 
This is what God has called us to do. And so fulfill the law of Christ. That looks like a heavy burden. Can I pray for you? What can I do to help you? That pleases the Lord. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, please. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. In Ephesians 4, verse 32, the Bible reads, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Jesus paid for your sin. He's forgiven you. You're forgiven by trusting in Him, not being good. No one's good enough. And now He's just saying, for Christ's sake, can you show some mercy to your brother? So that they might actually say, you know, I know a bunch of hypocrites. I've seen those Christians. Boy, that church over there and this one over there. And let me tell you a story about one day and they hurt me. And I'm like, yeah, me too, brother, me too. But let me tell you, there's something different about somebody that will fulfill the law of Christ and show some mercy to their brother. Somebody that's hurting and they're like, you know, I've met some hypocrites, but that person was different. That's how I imagined Jesus would be. And I saw it in their actions. This is my vision, is that we would look like Christ. Jesus wearied Himself by helping others, healing others, restoring others, preaching the gospel, so much they thought He was mad. He's just working, working, working. He won't even stop and take a break and eat with us. There were souls to be saved. I'm not telling you to act mad or crazy. But I, I'm telling you, we could all probably adjust our schedule a little bit and find some time for evangelism. Amen. Find some time to preach the gospel. Find a way. We're talking about healing people, using mercy. Second Chronicles 7. Now this is famous. I could probably ask for a volunteer to quote it, and I'm sure somebody in here could. Second Chronicles 7, 14. Let's read it and then talk about it. If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I want to start out by pointing out the most obvious part of this verse that most preachers, frankly, they kind of skip over it. If my people, now everybody say it. What does it say next? If my people, which are called by my name. my name. Now, I don't have a problem making a New Testament application with this because I am called by the name of Christ. But he's talking here to the children of Israel. He uses the phrase, if you look at verse 3, and when all the children of Israel... He says it again at the end of verse 6, all Israel stood. He said it in the middle of verse 8, and all Israel. He says it in verse 10 at the end, Solomon and to Israel, his people. He says it again in verse 18 at the end, nor fail thee a man to be ruler in Israel. Okay, so now wait a minute. Is God trying to tell us that his name is Israel? If my people, which you're called by, say it, my name... And he calls them Israel five times. Now, where does the name Israel come from? Jacob. Jacob was wrestling with the angel of the Lord. And he asked the angel what his name was. Now, I believe it was the Lord Jesus Christ before he came as Christ at Bethlehem, born of a virgin, right? So the angel of the Lord comes up and he's wrestling with Jacob and Jacob says, what's your name? And he keeps wrestling and he says, bless me. And he gives him a new name. That name is Israel, which means as a prince, you have power with God. And that angel, I believe, the Lord Jesus Christ, hey, Emmanuel, God with us, said, let me give you one of my titles, Israel. And all those that believe in me will also have this name, Israel. That was given to Jacob and his lineage, and it carried on. And when you get to 2 Chronicles here, he says, I'm reminding you who you're called by. And I say this to you, Christian. Whose name are you called by? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Whose name do you have spiritually sealed into your forehead? Well, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian. I'm not just talking about a, a Facebook status here. Oh, yeah, Christian, not Muslim. No, I mean who you really are, your identity in Christ. You know, in Isaiah 45, he says that he gave Israel a surname is the phrase it uses. You know what a surname is? Well, that's a family name. My father gave me my last name of Fanon. My children have my last name of Fanon. But my Lord gave me a surname of Christian. I want to show you how can we heal this land? How can we heal the brokenhearted? How can we heal the broken families? Look what he says, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, well, it starts by seeing who we are compared to God, and pray and seek my face. Now, wait, how do we do this? Lord, I'm nothing and you're everything and I need your help. Lord, I'm coming to you because you have all the answers and I'm seeking your will. I'm seeking your face. I want to get closer to you. Uh, I had a child last night, got in trouble over something and uh, they did one of these. I said, uh, I don't tell their name. I don't want to get them in trouble. And they're doing one of these. And it's like, I'm talking to you and they're doing one of these. And they're kind of about like turning their head and trying to hide from me. And it's like, I see you. You can't hide from daddy. And you got to look me at the eyes at some point because you're in trouble how many Christians are not seeking God's face and I want to challenge you guys on this the gospel is easy to be saved is easy living the Christian life is hard and when you've broken your daddy's rules and you know he's disappointed with you you don't really want to look in his face sometimes there are people within a two mile radius of here that are saved we're going to see them in heaven and they need somebody to restore them to church. We need to tell them, hey, your daddy is calling you. Your father called. He said, come by the house. He wants to see you. He loves you. While we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. I believe the Lord wants us to reach into this community and get the Christians that are backslidden back on track. To heal them to heal their walk with God. He says, pray and seek my face. And here it is, listen. Turn from their wicked ways, whatever that may look like. Listen, thank God you're saved, but you know what? You need to uh, uh, put down those drugs. You need to quit uh, uh, drinking. You need to, uh, maybe you need to put the PlayStation down or maybe you need to quit watching Jaguar football and get in church and quit worrying about what the world has. You need to change your priorities and you need to make it the Lord Jesus Christ and His house. Make that the priority and God will heal you. Look what He says. Turn from their wicked ways. Then, here's the good news. Well, I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Did you notice which, which sins he said he didn't pay for? Oh, wait, he paid for them all? Well, that's good news. Yeah, but you don't know what I've been through. It doesn't matter. I know the God that hears from heaven, and he's already paid, and he wants to forgive you. Will you seek his face? Will you turn from your wicked way? Will you get back close to God? Then will I forgive their sin and will heal their land. Will you spend the next week with me praying for this area of West Jacksonville? Amen. I have a big vision for this area. I believe God brought me here six years ago. He has a big plan. Six years ago, I preached my first sermon in Jacksonville to the day. And uh, it's on YouTube if you want to see it. And I, I said, we're a soul winning church. I said, even if I have to do it by myself, that's what we're going to do. And there's been some Saturdays I, I did it by myself, and that's okay. I'm thankful that somebody preached me the gospel and that I'm saved. Go back to Isaiah 61, please. Go back to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, 
to proclaim liberty to the captives. I can't tell you how much that means to me. You know that Jesus set the captives free. Those that were in spiritual bondage without Christ, He has set them free. He set the captives free. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ has done more uh, for women's rights and ending slavery than anybody else. There's no more Jew nor Greek. We're all one in Christ. There's, we're not a slave or bond or free or you're better than me. No, no, no. We're all one in Christ. I know this world has a differing standard, but when God looks down and He sees your faith, He says, that's my child now. And He wants to protect that child. To proclaim liberty to the captives. We're no longer in the bondage of sin, but unfortunately some of us continue therein. And we keep, like a dog, going back to the vomit. We keep going back to that same thing instead of letting uh, the Holy Spirit lead us. We're saved by faith, and thank God for that. But now, we need to proclaim His name and the name of freedom from sin. Freedom. A sinful life is no fun. It's pleasurable for a moment, for a season, the Bible says. You go and you get your booze. You're depressed on the way there. You come out of the booze store and you got your, you're lugging it to the car. And you're in the middle of your, oh, and you're like, hey, oh, woo! And you wake up the next morning, oh, why is the room spinning? Read Proverbs 23. It tells you how miserable it is. You wake up, beat up, and you're like, what happened to me? Why am I bloody and bruised? Yet will I seek it again. Oh, I just can't stop. Oh, I hate that stuff. I heard a guy one time talking about drugs, and he said, I swear I'll never touch it again. Why, you got some? <laughs> Boy, if that just doesn't tell you how addictive sin is, and also how miserable it is. I hate it! Ooh, there it is again. There's no true joy in that. There's no lasting joy. There's no freedom in addiction. None. God has the power to deliver us from that. I really believe, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't matter what it says on the road. Temple Baptist Church. Law of Liberty Baptist Church. It needs to say freedom! Free in Christ! He came to set the captives free. He's proclaiming literally, if you come up here and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and then you get this word in your heart, man, it will change you from the inside out. You know the Holy Ghost, right? Now think about it. He moves inside of you. How many of you have ever had a roommate? You've had to live with a roommate. Yeah. You're not talking about your wife, are you? No, oh, no. He's in trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I had a roommate one time and he used to drive me nuts. This dude was always doing stuff wrong and he'd leave this and that. You know, it's like, come on, man, right? Then I've had other roommates where they're like, well, I mean, well, I'll tell you about, let me tell you about my roommate now. Neat and clean and orderly and kind. I'm so thankful for that roommate. But you know, first things first, she's like, why do you still have this shirt? It has holes in it. And I'm like, that's my favorite. Don't throw it away. Now, when you get married to the Lord, when two come together as one, the Holy Spirit moves in and he starts looking around your house. He's like, ooh, is that a rock and roll poster? Oh, I want to tear this thing down and we got to get rid of this. And what kind of a movie is this? That's a false God. That's an idol. That doesn't honor the, the God that saved you. We got to throw that away. And you begin to resist the Holy Ghost. He comes in and he says, I want to paint these walls and clean this place up so we can really use it for something good. We'll sanctify it. We'll set it apart for a holy use. And you're like, oh, I'm still clinging on to some of this stuff. Liberty. Freedom. Not bondage. There's no bondage in Christianity. The world tells you about a failing Christianity. And most of them, it's like Mormonism. It's a cult. They're trusting their good works to get to heaven and they don't even believe in the same heaven. There's three different heavens and you might be a god over a planet and all this weird, bizarre, satanic doctrine. True biblical Christianity is freedom, liberty, not bondage, not grief, not stress. When Jesus read this, He came to a people that were enslaved by the Romans. They want it. They're like, Lord, set up your kingdom now. Kick them out. We're ready to rule. And he's like, you don't get it yet. There's some spiritual things that's going to happen, and you'll do that in the millennium. But right now, he said, suffer. Pick up your cross and follow me. Most won't do it. 
He ends, he says, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Guys, do you know you have the keys to the prison house? You have the keys to get them out of their cage. Now, sometimes you have to sort of rattle the cage so that they see they're in a cage. Hey, man, don't you know you're in bondage to the devil? We've got to rattle this cage. Wake up. Look at where you're at. Get out of that cage. I've got the key right here. It's the gospel. Let me unlock that thing and get you out. You'll be free. It's free. God is so good. Look at verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance. Listen, there's a judgment coming. Of our God to comfort all that mourn. You know what Christians ought to do? We ought to comfort those that mourn. That's a Christian characteristic. Verse 3, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes. Now, imagine that. I work with a guy, and he was complaining about the boss. Now, whenever somebody complains about the boss, I always recommend you tell them, well, great, why don't you go start your own company tomorrow? And you can buy the truck and the tools, and you can fill the shelves with stock, and you can make payroll for a bunch of people. I mean, you got it all figured out, buddy. You go do it. This guy was complaining about the boss and some of his choices, and I already knew the answer, but I said, hey, has he ever done anything for you, like above and beyond? Well, well, well yeah. Well, what did he do? Tell me. Well, my house burnt down, and the insurance company only paid so much, and we weren't going to be able to rebuild it. And he paid for the lumber and the labor he sent all his guys over here, and they restored my house. It went from ashes to beauty. I said, man, he's been that good to you? And you're complaining about a little bit of this or that? I wonder how many Christians are like that. Now, we have some things going on in our world where it's like we're looking at ashes. You ask some people, and they're like, well, Biden's in the office. This is it. It's all over. We're just, there's just nothing but ashes left, you know. You're not going to believe the bills this month. Oh, what are we going to do? Well, he says he wants to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. If you're heavy hearted today, I want you to know that God wants to lift you up. He wants to cheer you up. He says, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He says that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He might be glorified. What's it say? What's that last thing it says there in verse 3? That He might be glorified. We're looking for our own glory. If we would quit that and put it on the Lord, cast your cares upon Him, right? What we talk about on Wednesday, cast your burden upon the Lord and He shall sustain thee. That means He'll pay for everything. He'll take care of it. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved, He says, is the rest of that verse. Verse 4, And they shall build up the old wastes, and they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. We live in a time when churches are closing down, and I believe God wants us to get together and keep a church open. I believe God wants us to come together in the spirit of unity and of love and have a sound mind and cast it all on the Lord and say, God, we need a huge miracle. We're trusting in you. We want to hear from you. If you'll take care of business, we'll follow you. Look at the next chapter. Look at 62 and we'll finish. This is important. Uh, look at verse 2. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness. Again, this is a millennial promise. And the king's thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name. Did you know in the resurrection you're going to get a new name? It talks about it in Revelation. Now, when you... Rise from the ashes when you get to heaven, when you're with the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord, at the sound of that last trump, when you're with the Lord, you know what's going to happen? He's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now let me give you a name according to the work you did for me. Maybe you play the piano and God's going to give you a name dealing with the musician or composition or the praise. Maybe you 
sweep the floor around here and you're a custodian and God says He calls you uh, something to do with being in order and keeping things neat. I, I don't know what these names are, but I imagine that just like heaven is supernatural, this name also will be supernatural. It used to be that names meant things. Now people just throw them around like it doesn't matter. He's going to give us a new name. He says, which the mouth of the Lord shall name, in verse 2, verse 3, thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah, and thy land Beulah, for the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. He says, I'm going to bring it all together. Here's what's cool. And I didn't know we were singing about Beulah land this morning. Uh, I don't pick the songs. Uh, I trust the Holy Spirit to work through the other people in our church. We sang dwelling in Beulah land. And look, this is where it comes from. He says, you're not going to be forsaken and empty and desolate anymore. God's going to bless you, and it's going to be like being in Beulah land. I promise you this, if you'll get a hold of this vision, I'm going to continue the thought tonight. I have a vision for this area, and it starts with preaching the gospel. If we'll exalt Christ as great, see ourselves as sinners, be willing to do the service and do the hard work for Him. Be willing to go to the brokenhearted and lift them up out of the mire. I believe that God will do an awesome work right here in these walls. I believe it. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Your promises. Thank You for Your blessings. Lord, I thank You for every soul that's here today. Lord, I pray that through the power of Your Holy Spirit, if there's one here that needs to be saved through the conviction of Your Spirit, You would draw them. Lord, if there's someone here that's been struggling with sin and they're saved, but they just keep going back like a dog to the vomit, Lord, I ask that You would help them to get victory, that You would help them to uh, find accountability in a brother or sister in Christ. Lord, I pray that this church would be a place where people can come to heal the broken parts of their life. Lord, we ask for Your, for your will. Oh God, we need You in this situation. We ask that You would clearly let Your will be known and help us to be faithful to make it done. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.